I know. It's just, it's in my, it's in my way. You are now watching The Chris Bell Show. Hey, hey. <laughs> There's no guest on this particular show. This is gonna be my origin story for whom LaBelle tolls. A lot of you have just discovered me recently. Some of you have been around for the last couple of years. Some of you have been around since I very first uh, stepped on stage. I come from a place called Thunder Bay, Ontario, Canada. And for those of you that aren't from Canada, I'm sure you're familiar with Ontario. It's a province here. It's uh, the home of the Toronto Raptors, which I'm sure you're very familiar with. You see where I'm from, we're 19 hours from Toronto. And from another province over to us, to the west, we have Winnipeg, Manitoba, which is eight and a half hours away. And the closest state that we have next to us is Minnesota. And their largest city that's the closest to us is Minneapolis, which is also nine hours away. And north of us is nothing but bush. We come from the middle of nowhere and the largest freshwater lake on earth, Great Lakes. <sighs> Don't, not yet, don't, don't, that was terrible. I wasn't working there. Come on, don't do it to me. Don't do it. Yeah. Thunder Bay is situated on one of the largest freshwater lakes in the world, which is Lake Superior. It's like being on an ocean. So here we are in the middle of nowhere on this like ocean-like lake and nothing's around us. It's just this community of 100,000, 115,000 people. You know, we survived on pulp and paper mills and uh, otherwise, you know, grain elevators and a lot of export utilizing the Great Lakes. Hospitality was big and tourism was big for a while. Now my hometown is renowned for being the murder capital of Canada. It's a rough place and not just this year, like four out of five years. And uh, it's a tough place. You know, when I grew up as a kid, you know, it wasn't easy, man. I, I, you know, I've mentioned in other podcast episodes and, you know, I've got my, I got the shit kicked out of me tons of times. There's kids watching back home in T-Bay and they're like, oh man, I was one of the guys. Yeah, you were, but I probably kicked the shit out of you now and you're probably bald and fat. So go fuck yourself. I aged perfect. <laughs> you know, when I came out of my mother's womb, a heathen, I was wheezing. I had asthma. And back in the 70s, if you had asthma, you might as well have the black lung. They didn't know what it was those days. They put me into a bubble, no joke. From like the age of like one to five, I was in the emergency in this bubble, this oxygen tent, all the time. You have no idea, like I was the original bubble boy. That's what I did. I just grew up in a oxygenated bubble with other kids in bubbles. My bubble was fed full of oxygen because I couldn't breathe outside the bubble. So I'm kind of like an X-Men character. And as I get older, you know, I'm finding that I'm having more powers. You know, I have learned how to utilize my clairvoyant abilities to read minds and energies around me. And being a bubble boy, you know, it had its perks. You know what I'm saying? I used to get fed through a little flap. I used to put my food into a flap and then flap it back up. And then I used to have bullies in other bubbles that would get out of their bubbles. And I was like, holy shit, these kids are crazy. And they knew I had breathing problems. So what they would do is they would take their leftover candy wrappers and stuff them into my, my vents so oxygen couldn't come in. So there I was, like, you know, I didn't know what to do as a little Italian kid. My mother just would kick the shit out of me if I did anything wrong. So I couldn't breathe. So I would just sit there just like suffocating because my vents were closed in this plastic bubble. That was traumatizing. And like, that's my first memories as a kid, being in this secluded city in Canada, surrounded by bush for hundreds and thousands of kilometers. And the only way out was just like this one lone highway and a little dangly airport. And I live by that airport. In fact, it's the strangest thing. I feel like I grew up in a big city because the street that we lived on was the busiest street in Thunder Bay. It was the main road to and from the busiest paper mill in Northern Ontario that employed well over a thousand people. So on shifts, right, your morning shift and night shift, you know, you'd have a thousand cars going one way at seven o'clock in the morning. And then at 4.30, you'd have another thousand cars going another way. So I always grew up 
like it was like almost like growing up in Times Square. There was just so much honking and noise and cars. And then the little dinky airport I lived by, so planes were coming in all the time. Plus we lived by a railway, so there was trains all the time. So there was always motion. And there was something about the traffic and the, the hustle and bustle. I didn't grow up in a big city, but for some reason, that little part of town where the street would have a thousand cars a day, to and from, four times a day, and with the airport being right there, I feel like it gave me a sense of urgency to want more, to, to know where these cars were going, where these planes were going, where these trains were going. I knew it wasn't meant to be in a small town. I mean, listen, I'm, in a, I'm from a small town in Canada. If you can't play hockey in Thunder Bay, they diagnose you with special needs. It's a reality. If you can't skate, you might as well be a leper from back in the day in Jesus' time. Nobody wanted to touch you. Nobody gave a shit about you, right? You can't skate. How do you explain to kids that you can't skate when everybody can skate? There's two-year-olds out there ripping around the ice, little Wayne Gretzky's, right? Little Sidney Crosby's, then there was me, this little brown-faced weirdo that his mother bought him figure skates because she didn't know the difference between hockey skates and figure skates. My mother wouldn't even give me a pair of skates growing up as a kid because she was scared about the blade. Yeah, before he even got skates, she doesn't remember this. My, well, I mean, she's passed away, God rest her soul. But before she died, my mother one time gave me a pair of Sorrells and butter knives with tape and tried to suggest that I can make my own skate. Yeah, this is the same woman that circumcised me at seven years old. Let that sit in for a second. Why did I get circumcised at seven? I went to school with kids like, you know, back in my day, it was like JK to grade eight. So grade eights in Thunder Bay back in the day, these guys were like 16 years old and I had to use the same urinal. So there I am like seven years old, going to the bathroom next to a guy who's 15. And I remember him looking down and saying, nice carrot top. And I didn't know what he meant. Hey, anteater. I'm like, well, anteater, what's an anteater? You're the toque, LaBelle. What the fuck is a toque? I remember running home to my mom, like, ma, Ma, the guy says I got an ant in it. I got a toque. My mother, no, no, you don't got a toque. Hey, I, I, I knew to take it off. I, we're going to take it off. I'm like, what do you mean? We're going to snip the end. What do you mean we're going to snip the end? The doctor took the end off. My mother, being the frugal woman that she was, she was impressed with the work. But she wasn't impressed the fact that I had to miss a week of swimming lessons she paid for. So she made me a makeshift diaper. Yeah, electrical tape, grocery bags, and a garbage bag. And then she pulled my Speedo up over top of it. Let me tell you, when I jumped in that water, and when 1980 pools were so full of chlorine and that chlorine hit my, my area, I was traumatized. Gah! To fucking gah! And, but, ah! and the kids were like, what's wrong with Chris? And I'm, ah! I'm in the water, I couldn't get out. They had to fish me out with one of those poles. And then as I came out of the water, the entire plastic diaper she made me went down my leg and the kids were like, wah! And I remember like running to the change room and the lifeguard, no running on deck, and I had to walk. And the more I walked, the more the bag, the garbage bag started coming out and it was duct taped to the end and, oh God, it was humiliating. And the pain, the pain. So my first seven years, I grew up in a bubble. I got circumcised after seven years. You know, that's like taking a puppy when it's like five years old and being like, you know what? Whiskers, we're gonna, Whiskers not really a dog's name, listen, What's a fucking dog's name anyways? Listen, Max, we're gonna cut your fucking tail off. No more tail. I had no tail. They cut my tail off at seven years old. This is the kind of shit that I had to deal with, not to mention I had an alcoholic father. You know, people be like, oh, my parent drank, my parent drank. My dad, okay? You got a picture of this, 1980s. My dad used to wear fluorescent shorts and a fluorescent shirt, like muscle shirt. And then he had like a mesh cap on with tinted bifocals. And he always wore like these sandals. He was always well tanned, but he was hammered. One time he came to a t-ball game and I, I struck out. And I'll never forget hearing, Jesus Christ, fucking cigarette flying. I see this man angrily walk away from the stands into his 1983 Cadillac Eldorado Canary Yellow. And I tore off with an eight track plane of Hall and Oates in the background. And there I stood, freshly circumcised, struck out a t-ball, fresh out of a bubble, no friends. And my dad just left me at a baseball diamond. Yeah, listen, we all got sob stories. Trust me, all you gotta do is work harder. That's what I did. I didn't grow up easy. It was insane. You know, in fact, I had ADHD as a child. By the time I was in grade two, you gotta understand, having ADHD in the 80s meant that you were like, 
you know, they just classified you as being autistic or disabled. So before I went to grade three, they put me into a learning disability class. Can you imagine that? My desk was drilled to the floor. I never even had a lid on our desk. We just had an empty desk and we sat there and watched projectors all day while the other kids were doing crazy ass shit. All I could do was look out the window. There was bars on the window. Fucking bars on the window. Can you imagine being eight years old in a classroom with bars on the window? Your desk drilled to the floor? The teacher talking to you in his really soft manner at all times? My scissors couldn't even cut paper. They were pretend scissors. I used to tell my mother, Ma, you gotta get me out of here, Ma. You gotta break me out of here. These kids, they're not right. Ma, they're different than I am. Jerry Mielli, he had Tourette's. Jerry would be like, fuck, 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 fuck. That's all he would do, fuck, fuck. And he'd grab his dick at all times. I'm like, what are you doing, bro? It freaked the shit out of me. Jerry was crazy. We had one kid, Jamie. In fall, we were whack. We were like at an iron with wax paper, and we were waxing over leaves. And then this kid, Jamie, picks up the iron and goes, "Hello, hello." And I'm like, "Who the fuck are you talking to?" And I takes the he takes an iron down. His ear is melted to his head. My mother finally took me out of that class. But I mean, here's my first run out the gate. Oxygen tent alcoholic father, circumcised at seven, learning disability class. Oh, fuck, it was, a, it was a nightmare, needless to say, until my Scottish stepfather came into the scene. Yeah, Sandy, this guy, this guy was something else. See, my mother was a four foot 11 Italian, big afro. Hey, how you doing, Maro? You hungry, you wanna eat something? <laughs> my name is Gina. She was so Italian. My Scottish stepfather, was six foot six, 300 pounds, knew nothing but labor. He used to look at me with disgust at all times. He'd just always look at me, just, look at you, look at you sitting there, laddie, with your dit, dit, dit machine. And I didn't know what dit, dit, dit meant, but remember, you know, gamers, gamers, they're always fucking jamming on, fucking just wilding out on the fucking joystick. I guess I used to do that too, but we only had two buttons. Pa, 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 pa. Da, 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 da. My Scottish stepfather went crazy. He goes, Laddie, you spend more time in front of your bloody TV than you do outside. You need to get out there. I'll tell you right now. You, if you don't go out, I'll batter your skull, Laddie. I'll crush your bones. And that was him being nice. You see, Scottish people from that generation didn't have empathy. There was no today's parenting. Um, we're going to talk with our counselor in the safe space and discuss the way you are retaliating the rules that we're presenting to you. My Scottish stepfather would say things like, I'll rip your bones from your fucking body, laddie. I'll tear your limb from limb. I'll make a stew from you. <laughs> Then you have my mother. Hey, I see that you're acting up in school. The principal called me today. The principal called me today. Marona Cristel for all Kikasufaya Laura. My mother would take everything she had in the house. Wooden spoon, shoe, fist, pa, bam, boom, ha. You understand what that's like? Getting the shit kicked out of you by your mom? My mom was, my mom was four foot 11. She was like a Tasmanian. It was weird. It was crazy. It was just like a, I don't know, it's like an Oompa Loompa. Just fucking coming at me. Just pa, 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 pa. Right? Didn't stop. You know, I remember the first time I had to mow the lawn. I, I didn't know to push on the, on, the, on, the, on the pushing part. There was the stabilizing bar between, and I tucked underneath and I pushed that. And I remember my stepfather looking at me and goes, you're fucking daft, laddie. You didn't even know what part of the handle to push. You, you can't even mow a lawn. I was 13 years old. I was old enough to know better, but I was kind of stupid. See, that's the thing. Parents don't understand. They think their teenagers are absolutely fucking morons. But I'm starting to look back in life and think, man, I was stupid at 13. You know what I mean? I didn't know any better. I already sniffed Pam. I huffed white out. I even huffed gas once. Yeah, I huffed gas. How about that for a confession? Yeah, it didn't do any long-term damage to me. But see, that's the lifestyle that we're living now, right? Kids today have so many options and freedom with technology. I mean, you could build an empire with technology. Me, I just fucking played Nintendo in my spare room. And we had a spare room because my whore of a sister moved out at the age of 14 years old. She moved out, that became my rec room. Come on, 
Poor people, you know exactly what I'm talking about. When your siblings move out, your parents stuff a couch in a little tiny room with a TV, and that's your gaming room, that's your room to fuck off. That was my room. Never left that place. Sat there and gamed. I'm always on my son all the time. You're a fucking loser, gaming all the time. Look at you. I get it now. Parents, don't be too hard on your kids gaming. Let me, let me remind you. In this day and age, be grateful that your children are at home, okay? Be grateful that they're not out fucking around with fentanyl and drinking booze and taking molly with a bunch of assholes. If your child is at home playing video games and you keep pushing them to go out, one day they'll go out and be mindful because they may not want to come back. Suddenly, they come back with a nose piercing. Yeah, septum, that's the one. I don't know, fuck that septum piercing. Sorry, anybody that's got the septum piercing, but I don't like it, right? They got tattoos, not good ones like mine, little piecework tattoos, right? I got $150, can I get a tattoo? And they just got a whole bunch of little piecework on them. That's how your kids gotta come home, piecework tattoo, right? Wearing 90s clothes, confused, living on the floor of his buddy's place, eating craft dinner that's not even real craft dinner, because when I grew up, craft dinner was good. Now it's shit. I got into trouble, too. I got into so much trouble. I was an animal. I was drinking and doing drugs by 13 years old. Drinking and doing drugs by 13 years old, right? I remember one time these older kids dropped off a garbage bag of mushrooms to me when I was 15. And I remember like putting them all in tinfoil and selling mushrooms at 15 years old, okay? This is 20, like seven years ago. So when people are like, I microdose psilocybin, I microdose, I like the microdose. I've been doing fucking mushrooms for 30 years. And let me tell you, there was no such thing as microdosing. You reached in the bag, you looked at what you grabbed, and if you grab too much, oh well, I guess you're gonna trip out for a while. And you eat what you got, and you went on a journey, and you didn't have to fucking journal it and tell everybody about it, and like, I've been on a few psychedelic journeys. No one gives a fuck, okay, that the walls melted and you saw aliens. That's for you. You need to interpret what you saw on your journey. I don't give a shit myself. I've seen all sorts of things on my journey. I've literally, there's times I've done acid and thought I had died, and this was purgatory, the life I was living. It's almost like watching this episode. You're like, am I alive? Am I actually watching this? Is this guy just admittedly say that he huffed gas and sold mushrooms by the garbage bag at 15? Yeah, I did. Listen, growing up as a kid, I, I didn't care about being a criminal. I was into it. I was down, right? I thought I was such a badass throwing crab apples at cars and raiding gardens and taking clothes off people's clotheslines. And that was until we started stealing cars and fucking fencing things to buy drugs with. I didn't know any better. It was crazy. All of us drank and partied like that. We had no cell phones. Didn't have to worry about getting caught, right? You get caught, you might get the shit kicked out of you by the guy you fucked with. Cops didn't care. Cops just care about the bad stuff, real bad stuff. I mean, kids today have access to cocaine. You hear that engine running by? Whoa! Real sports car out there, probably a fucking 97 Civic with a fucking terrible exhaust. Yeah, you know who you are. Anyway, I luckily was able to persevere during my high school years. And high school was wild, right? Drugs, drinking, fighting, crime, and then one day, I took a look around. I took a look around at the people that were in my top five. A lot of these guys were never sober. They had no expectations, no goals, no ambition. A lot of the guys were just content growing a beer belly and fishing on the weekends. And in fact, fishing any chance they had. And quite frankly, I couldn't play hockey. I was a terrible fisherman. I was scared of bugs. Like, nobody was more scared of bugs than me. Even to this day, if we're out having coffee and a fucking leaf falls down, if I think it's a wasp, I'm gone. Gee, I'm out of the fucking table. I can't even deal with it. I'm like, wasp! Wasps are terrifying, by the way. They also bite and sting. That's how these motherfuckers operate. They bite you and sting you, and they live. You get a bumblebee, this beautiful little bumblebee that pollinates all the plants and flowers. It brings us honey and oxygenates all the plants through photosynthesis. I don't know, I'm not Bill, not the science guy, but fucking bees are good. Don't fuck with a bee, right? But hornets, wasps, what's your problem? You guys are like liberals, just fucking stinging and flying away. You contribute dick all. You know, a lot of people don't know that I sobered up at the end of my days back in Thunder Bay and I went away to college. You see, I wanted to be a police officer. Yeah, I went away to police college. 
back in uh, 1998. I went to a place called Kirkland Lake, Ontario. My mother wouldn't allow me to go to Toronto or Ottawa or anywhere cool because she thought I would just become an asshole. So I went to Kirkland Lake, Ontario, which is just like Thunder Bay, except no lake in the middle of nowhere. I spent two years there studying police science. I was one of the first students to ever come out with a GPA over 3.5. In fact, I was only the second class ever in a program that Canada knows as Police Foundations. Our instructor at the time was uh, Donnie Walton, a former OPP commander. And at that time, the curriculum there it was, they wasn't established yet. So Donnie just took 25 years of policing and being an inspector and trained us with some of the most advanced criminal training you can have, or excuse me, like um, criminal code training and interview and investigations. And um, he basically trained us as we were cops. And when we eventually went on to write our exams, many students went on to become police officers. Not me, I, uh, I failed all three of my interviews with police services. I did not pass the psychological exam. They thought that I was a little high strung, a little careless, perhaps a little ambiguous in regards to following the rules. In fact, they thought I would just be a fucking gun crazy animal leaping out of buildings and racing cars. I was a nutcase. I wouldn't have given me an opportunity to carry a gun and arrest people either. Now, different story. Then, eh, they might have had a point. Of course, I was undiagnosed for bipolar at that time and my ADHD was rampant. I also suffered from severe anxiety. No one talks about mental health. And if they do, it's a post here, it's a post there. Some shows dedicate an hour or two to it, but mental health is a motherfucker. And if you're out there and you struggle with it, it comes in all different forms, shapes, and sizes, from hearing voices to getting anxiety to being down on yourself, right? Self-deprecating yourself at all times, losing your confidence. You know depression even physically can hurt you. Sometimes you have aches and pains, you just don't know why. That could be depression, right? Bipolar, sometimes you ever get really excited and you start just spitting off at the mouth and you have all these ideas and you have all this energy and you're almost getting to where you gotta get and then all of a sudden one day you wake up and you're down and depressed. That's being bipolar manic. And most people relate with bipolar mania. That's what I have, you know? One time or two, like, you know, you'll catch me in the street and I'll be like, hey, 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 hey how are you? Oh yeah, this is great. And the next day I'm avoiding you. I won't even make eye contact because I'm on the other spectrum of the bipolar. Right? I'm, I'm dark, I'm moody, I'm agitated. Um, and then anxiety kicks in, and if you've ever had anxiety, it's fucking crippling. I can't stand dealing with anxiety. I get anxiety over everything. You know, you know what I mean? Like, I'm a guy that, like, if someone has the volume on a car and they put it at 15, I'm like, why don't you put it at 16 or 14? Why 15? 15's an odd number. I get kind of funny. I look at people, how they tie their shoe. I'm like, what are you doing? Double bow? Single knot. Come on, man. What's the matter with you? Every little thing. Like, if I'm watching somebody paint and there's a spot, I'm like, how do they not see that spot? Or when a server comes by and wipes your table down and do a shitty job, I'm like, why don't you wipe it right? There's crumbs still in the corner there. It's just the little things. It's the, it's the, uh, it's the neurotic behavior of an artist, I guess you can say. And sometimes I can't control it. And then I get anxiety, then I get triggered. And anxiety comes and presents in all different forms and ways, you know? Like some people get intimidated, some people get overconfident. Other people, it just, it's crippling. Like you just cannot be around people. You can't be around yourself. Sometimes you can't even get out of bed. I've been through it, man. I've heard voices. You know, I've, had, I've been so sick at times, I've been medicated. Luckily, fitness, nutrition, self-discipline, and my son, as an anchor, has helped me battle through some serious times. So, you know, if you're one of those people out there that relate to what I've just said, whether you want to get help or not, that's entirely up to you. But just know, taking a pill and caring about your day, thinking that pill will be the cure to all your mental health issues, it's not it. It's a lifestyle change. You got to work hard, you got to persevere, and you can't stay down on yourself. You got to surround yourself with positive people. If the people around you don't make you feel great about yourself, fucking cut them loose, right? It doesn't matter about a popularity contest. Be around people that are caring, kind, loving, affectionate, enthusiastic, positive. Don't spend time with negative people, narcissists. It's the worst, man. If you spend time with someone that's always arguing every opinion you have, even if it's good or bad, it's exhausting. Don't waste your time arguing with others. You wanna be able to flow. And that's what the key to life is, being able to flow because when you can flow, you can adapt. And if you can adapt, that allows you to align yourself with what's successful and what's not. It gives you the mental focus and awareness.
to which direction you want to head to on your journey. Don't spend too much time on your phone either. You ever see people on their phones walking down the street? Like in this day and age, you're watching people, like the worst is mask, phone, sandals, trudging, head down, not even looking at where you're going. You know who you are and we know those people. To me, that's the 2021 zombie. It doesn't have to be like The Walking Dead. A regular zombie in 2021 is some millennial that just can't even realize that he's not a Gen Z. Sorry, bro, you're not Gen Z. I still wear skinny jeans. Apparently that dates me, but I'm never going back to baggy pants. I fucking look great. I work my legs, man. I got a flat stomach. Why am I going to wear baggy clothes? Go fuck yourself. But that's the whole premise of that. I've watched so many, I would say like Gen Z and millennials, just head down into their phone, no awareness. At any given time, somebody can just grab you by your little fucking scrawny neck, crack it. You feel so safe and entitled that nobody would disturb you. You actually have the audacious nature that if I don't move out of your way while your head's down and you're texting in your own little fucking la la land, you look at me with a scowl? No, you move the fuck out of the way. Because if you're not present, you don't exist to me. Because out there, it's gonna get tough. It's gonna get a lot tougher. And if you don't prepare for the new world and you think things are going back to normal, oh, you're gonna be, you're gonna be of a rude awakening. Trust me, digging deep, persevering and preparing is what you should be preparing for. Just because things are lifting and there'll be no more masks and restaurants and patios are open, what are you gonna do when you don't have any money left from Serb? Are you ready to work? Are you ready to go back into the workforce? Are you ready to go back to making 18 to $20 an hour after a 44 hour work week? No, nobody wants to work. All I see online are friends and entrepreneurs that have businesses that can't find quality employees because they've become so conditioned to accepting the handout. They've lost their ambition and dedication to employment. Don't be that person. Get your hands dirty, do what it takes and make your own buck. And I don't care how you do it. You know, girls will be like, oh, she's on OnlyFans. Well, guess what? That's what she chose to do. If she's making three, $4,000 a month, utilizing her assets or his assets physically and in a sexual manner, well, that's called sex trade. And the sex trade industry right now, just like all other forms of, um, what can we say, diverse communities, they're a part of a community and they are working legally. And it's funny how we shun people for what they do, but that person is making count. That person is making their own income. Their hand isn't out. I've never watched OnlyFans to this day. I've never seen an episode or I've never tuned into it or I, I just can't. I don't even watch Pornhub. I got to a point in life where I'm just, it doesn't do it for me. It just doesn't. I leave, I'm not into fucking porn. You know, some people are. I'm just not into it. I prefer the real thing. There's like this misconception about me when it comes to dating. I don't know if you guys notice or not, if you follow me online, there's very few pictures of me and the opposite sex. Um, I've tried some relationships. They didn't go so well. And after some time, I realized, you know, dating takes a lot of time and energy away from your dreams and your aspirations. You have to share space. You have to share energy, your soul. You have to adapt, you know, happy wife, happy life. It's a fact. Sometimes you have to change your entire journey just to keep that piece of in the bond, even though you're losing whatever you worked for and gained. And you know all that text messaging and talking and aimless times. Like how many times do you want to sit there and watch Netflix? You don't, you know you could be working, but you do it for your partner. How many times are you gonna go out to eat and you're like, oh fuck again? You know I could cook here? I'll do it for my partner. Trips, visits with friends, employment choices, housing choices, living standards, savings, like, it doesn't end. When you're in a monogamous relationship, you know, you have to be prepared, like, that's it. You're no longer 
an individual that's living their life for themselves. You're sharing that responsibility now. Me, I tried it. It doesn't work for me, you know? I, I'm a man that is an opportunist. I am gig to gig. I am an artist, I'm an entrepreneur. My hours are 12 to 20 hours a day. They never stop, seven days a week. My son, who I love and I've been a full-time father to since day one, you know, he could tell you. There's a lot of times I think, you know, you see in the movies, we're like, not now, not now, son. I, I, daddy's got a call, I, I got work to do. I used to be like, I'll never be that guy. Hmm. I'll be honest, man. There's a lot of times I've had to be that guy. I have to. If I don't, we don't eat. There's people out there sometimes being like, oh yeah, mental health issues, single dad, blah, blah. No, I'm sorry. Is that not my life? Is that not many people's lives? There's a lot of single parents out there and it is difficult. And sometimes we do like to share the difficulty because there's no one else to talk to about it, right? It's not easy being a single parent. It's not easy being a single parent that's an entrepreneur that has a dream to succeed in something other than like a nine to five. I've had to put my comedy career on hold and then with COVID and the restrictions, man, I'd finally built up these cannabis infused dinners. I was booked weekly. It was the best time before COVID shutdown came. I never had more success at anything, not even comedy. And now, man, I haven't cooked in two months. I lost it. But here we are today, sharing that story, being vulnerable, being open. I just wanna show a transparent side of who you're following, who I am. And that's what this episode's about. This episode is about who's the guy that you're following? Who's the guy in the Instagram photos? Who's the guy that posts all these crazy stories, reposting news with this little blurb at the bottom? You know, you hear stories about this guy that ran around stampede in a speedo and fur coat. You know, you hear about this guy that's out, you know, in the woods hunting and training and lifting. He talks about steroids and testosterone. He's always preaching some sort of message. And then there's people that have known me longer than that. I'm like, oh man, this guy can fuck a party. He's an animal. He's crazy. He's fucking, he's a little criminal. I'm all sorts of shit, but I evolved. Now, sober. Now, I'm dedicated. I'm devoted to putting out the best product that I can put out for those that are supporting. You know, new people come around, new fans, friends, community, welcome. I just feel that this episode is essential so you have an idea of who Chris LaBelle is. For whom LaBelle tolls, it's not quite a podcast, it's more a show. The intent and the integrity behind it is to share information, to be open and expressive and to allow guests that come on the show to have no boundaries, no censorship, not to conform to mainstream media, but just be yourself. Let's talk about what's not being talked about. That's the whole intent of the show. And I just wanted an opportunity to share a little bit about my life and who I am and who you're spending your time with. And I want you to stay watching. Don't click and scroll. Just watch the episodes. They're in under 45 minutes. We all have 45 minutes. I'm dedicating my time. LK Visuals dedicates his time. We're gonna be around for a while. I'm not, this isn't a flash in the pan. LK Visuals and I have been working together for a couple years. We make good product. And soon you'll see sponsors, you'll see comedic videos, you'll see guests that have probably done far more than I ever have in entertainment and in life. And they'll be here and they'll be sharing their story. If you wanna reach out, just message me. Just hit me up on Instagram or through the YouTube page. You can email me, chrislabelleyyc at gmail.com. If there's a topic that you wanna hear, or maybe you wanna be a guest, or you have input or feedback, I don't care, good or bad, share it. I got thick skin. I'm here. I'm here for you. I'm here for me. I'm here to succeed. Let's make this grow. Soon we'll have merch. You wanna buy merch? Great. Soon we're gonna have products. I'm not stopping just as a guy sitting at a table in my friend's gym, Alavanka, by the way, on 16th Ave, northeast of Calgary, one of the best jiu-jitsu schools in Canada. I would strongly suggest to come in here and learn self-defense because jiu-jitsu, well, I would say is the most reasonable self-defense in martial arts. Most fights end up grabbing 
pulling, and end up on the ground. Good jujitsu will keep you safe. It's offensive and defensive. Trust me, it'll save your life. Hit up Alavanca. You can see them online. There's links on my page. Trust me. Tim Blanchard, my professor, black belt, phenomenal guy. You'll love the school. The students here are super friendly, and they'll also train you as you roll. Jiu-Jitsu is life-changing. In fact, I've been doing it for a year. My body has adapted, my aches and pains are gone, I'm more flexible, and I'm more confident. I know that it's not just a street fight, like some Thunder Bay boy will go out there, hey man, you wanna fucking scrap or nah? Man, I'm, I'm ready. Like, I'm ready to, I'm ready for what's coming up in this new world. And I do feel that we should all be prepared, mentally, spiritually, financially, and physically. Because we don't know what's coming, but I do know it's gonna be good, as long as we keep our integrity and our morality and make sure to look out for others and be helpful and don't lose your humanity. The simplest forms of it is chivalry, holding doors, pulling out chairs, excuse me, pardon me, hello, how are you? I know it sounds old school, but it's what makes the world flow. Kindness, okay? Compassion, humanity, be in the moment, make eye contact. When you have a drink, be it alcohol or non, when you cheer someone, cheers and look them in the eye. You don't, you don't do this. You don't do this. You do this. And remember, you see those memes about like, it costs nothing to share, like, and support a friend's business. Now that I'm kind of in this industry, I agree. All you gotta do is subscribe to the page, share the episode, like the episode, comment. That takes two minutes. But what it does for me, we all know about algorithms and analytics. Yeah, it improves the show's analytics, which eventually will draw a sponsor or an investor that'll say, yo, love what you're doing. How do we sign on for a year? Now I have a job. LK's got a job, right? And then we get more people working by then having to develop merchandise and multiple shows and touring and booking. And then we help those that come on as guests. <sighs> Synergy, man. It all starts with you. I talked a little bit about dating and relationships, and I have to be honest, the relationships are super tough. And if I'm gonna close out anything on this show, I'm gonna close out on relationships. I've tried to date. I've tried my best to be good to my partners, and I am. I cook, I clean, I rub feet, I massage. Oh man, I'm the most cuddly guy you've ever dated. You know, I love to cook, I love to, um, empower my partners but unfortunately a few times in my life i've definitely cheated i'm not the only one who's never cheated or not cheated but i've definitely cheated and uh, i think that at some point everyone can relate to it we've all cheated i'm sure at some point early in our dating life or later in dating life but we're all compelled we all have our eye on something Right? Every time you're on your phone, if you're in a relationship, what are you looking at? You don't see, if you're a female, you don't see a jacked, beautiful man, right? You don't see some artistic hipster kind of guy or an artist or a business guy, whatever is your fancy. Or maybe it's the opposite sex. Who knows? But there's always something out there distracting us. Whether you're cheating digitally, right? People coming in your stories, sending hearts and flame emojis to your pictures. Yeah, some people are being supportive, but that opens the door. You know, when guys start popping into your DMs, it's nice, right? Get some attention, especially if they're good looking, cool dudes. All of a sudden you're kind of correlating with them, but you're in a relationship. Men do the same thing. We both do. Ultimately, being faithful is a commitment. A relationship is based on commitment and trust but it's also based on vulnerability. It's also based on removing the ego. When there's no ego, the flow is beautiful. Allow the love to come to fruition. Don't half-ass a relationship at any point because if you are only giving 50% or less, why are you dating? Don't be codependent on each other. There's codependency in a relationship is fucking the worst. You lose yourself, both of you do. 
if you guys have to need each other to get gas and to get groceries and to go get coffee and to make decisions about like what time one's coming home, you're wasting your time. Where are you? What are you doing? It doesn't matter where somebody is and what they're doing. Let somebody live. The key to a relationship is nurturing each other when you're there and being mindful when they're not. You know and I know when we're being unfaithful. Where the mind wanders, the heart follows. We're all seduced by beauty and whatever is the beauty is in the eye of the beholder. But man, we're living in a time where, geez, there is no body shape that's not admired in 2021. Me, hey, I like thick women. That's me. I love a thicker woman. I just, they're beautiful. But I also like a fit woman. I also like an older woman. I also diversify. There is really no culture I'm not into. There's nothing I'm not into. I find all humanity beautiful. So for me, yeah, it's not been easy trying to be in a monogamous relationship. Monogamous, monogamous. You know, it hasn't been easy because I'm full of life. My mind is always moving. There's always pieces going here and there. So it's hard for me to, you know, not look here and not look there. I find beauty in everyone. But that's when I realized I'm just not ready for a relationship. Even at 45 years old, I want to settle down. I want to give my love and undevoted passion to someone. I want to empower them. I want to make them their best. I want to love them with everything I have. And I want them to reciprocate that. And on top of it, love my son. Love us both. I would love to have a relationship that was full of life and positivity. And there was no small talk and wasting time and arguing. Oh God, arguing is exhausting. Especially in text. And you're basically battling in your mind. You're yelling in your mind. You're yelling every fucking letter you type. Just call each other or wait until you see each other. What's the point in blowing up the fucking phone? As I said, I've made mistakes. I've cheated on partners and it changed my life. I've taken full ownership for the itsy bitsy cheating that I've done in my day. It wasn't a lot, but I did. But that's the kind of transparency I'm trying to provide. I understand about making mistakes. I understand about hurting others because when you hurt others, you end up hurting yourself. So ultimately, my only advice for a relationship is to give it everything you got, to be transparent, to be vulnerable, to love without boundaries. Don't worry about getting hurt. Oh, I'm gonna get hurt, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna put these boundaries up. You're fucking selling yourself short. If you're not in the full way, you're not in. Learn to be single. If that's the case, learn to love your own company. You can't love another until you love yourself. I can promise you that. I'm 45 years old and I'm just becoming comfortable with myself. I learned one thing, being faithful is crucial. It's for your own personal morality, your integrity, your character. Carrying on a relationship with another while dating is exhausting and it tears you apart on the inside and it forces you to be dishonest. If you're dishonest, that makes the rest of your character become dishonest. And before you know it, you're lying to everybody, not just yourself. So on that, love your partner. If you watch this episode to the end, go out and do something. Let that partner know how much you care, right? It's not the big things. It's the little things. And listen, listen to what they're telling you. Because sometimes we're too busy worrying about what we're gonna say next, and we don't have to listen to what the people we're talking to is gonna say, especially our partners. Hey, I'm not a relationship expert, but I said, this episode is an opportunity for me to be transparent, to share wisdom and life experiences, because I would hate to see people make the same mistakes that I have. I've lived long enough, four decades, four decades of hard living to be able to share what I'm gonna be sharing with you on For Whom LaBelle Tolls. 
Thank you so much for staying tuned this long. Thank you so much for supporting the last four or five episodes. We have an amazing viewership. The attention rate is fantastic and the feedback's been beautiful. This show's going nowhere. It's only gonna be getting better. <sighs> now somebody go find me a wife. This is our time for you to subscribe. This is the revolution. This is the time that we will conquer together. We will rise to the heavens above only if you subscribe now. Oh, and make sure to like, leave a comment, and tell your friends about it too. <laughs>